Who is Kentucky Ballistics and why did he almost die on his YouTube channel? Listen up everybody, I have some news. Hey interns, I'm Dr. Chris Rayner and I am not your everyday ortho. I teach you about injuries, orthopedic surgery, and medical topics in a way that's easy to understand and entertaining. Today for Medical Rounds, I'm gonna look at the recent injury of the YouTube content creator, Kentucky Ballistics. His video talking about his recent injury came up in my feed a while ago and I found myself drawn to it. In his video, he detailed what happened at the time of his injury, what injuries he suffered, and the care that he received following his injury. If you wanna learn more about exactly what happened, you can watch his video on his channel. He has over 15 million views at this point, so it has definitely been well received. In this video, I'm gonna go over his injuries in more detail and provide a medical perspective on the treatments that he received. I hope to give those of you without a medical background a better understanding of what occurred. This this is definitely going to be a longer video, so buckle up. I should say that although this is not a firearm video, unfortunately for Scott, a firearm was involved in his injury. Although the injury was no fault of his own, if you're going to use a firearm, be sure to do so at a suitable range and follow all the appropriate safety guidelines for the range and the particular firearm that you are using. As Scott can attest, accidents can happen at any time. Scott also known as Kentucky Ballistics, was injured on April 9th, 2021, when his Serbu RN50 rifle exploded. He was firing Sabat Light Armor Penetrator, or SLAP rounds, which, unbeknownst to him, had been tampered with, and some of which were overloaded with gunpowder. During the course of his range session, he shot several of these rounds successfully before the accident occurred. However, at the end of his session, he decided to shoot one more round. Of course, this was the round that caused the malfunction of the rifle. Scott discusses the incident in detail, so I'll briefly show what happened and then discuss the injuries. When the rifle exploded, Scott suffered a number of injuries of various severity. The list of injuries suffered includes a comminuted right orbital fracture with transient blindness, a nasal bridge fracture, a lacerated jugular vein, a punctured right lung, and a displaced fracture of the left index finger. While most of these injuries were serious, both the jugular laceration and the lung injury were much more severe and could have proved fatal were immediate action not undertaken. Fortunately for Kentucky Ballistics, he this was not filming alone and he did not lose his consciousness when he was Scott. injured. His previous training in first aid and the quick actions of his father helped him to survive these injuries. With a punctured lung, air from inside the lung would be allowed to escape the lung and enter into the chest cavity. Over a short period of time, air outside of the lung, but inside of the chest, would compress the lung from the outside and not allow it to expand, making air entry into the lung impossible. With enough air inside the chest cavity, the trachea and the opposite lung are also compressed and displaced away from their normal position. This is what's known as a pneumothorax, and if left untreated, could result in complete inability to breathe and eventually even death. This is not really an injury that can readily be treated in the field as it requires an interventional procedure and sometimes actual surgery to fix. The lacerated jugular vein was particularly worrisome for several reasons. First, as Scott pointed out in his video, you can apply a tourniquet to the neck to gain control of the bleeding between the laceration and the heart. A tourniquet at neck level would occlude the airway, stop breathing, and eventually result in a loss of consciousness and death. Okay. Not really a good thing, and certainly not the desired outcome. Second, the laceration involved a jugular vein, which is one of the main vessels for blood flow, leaving the most energy-hungry organ of the body, the brain. The carotid and vertebral arteries bring a large amount of blood under pressure to the brain. The jugular veins, on the other hand, allow all of that blood to exit the brain en route to the heart after the oxygen it carries has been consumed by the brain. Disruption of this flow from the brain prevents its return to the heart, which can eventually allow the pump, the heart, to fall out of prime. At worst, the flow of blood is unrestricted and blood volume falls quickly. At best, the flow of blood is tamponaded by pressure and the flow of blood is slow to a speed that can be accommodated by the vessels on the other side of the neck. Blood volume continues to decrease, but at a slower rate. Collateral veins on the other side pick up some of the slack, but only to a certain degree. 
Third, the injury to the jugular vein poses more of a problem than does an arterial injury. The cross-sectional makeup of an artery and a vein are different. An artery is a high pressure blood vessel. To accommodate the flow of blood under high pressure, its walls are thick and contain muscle cells. Arteries do not contain valves. The flow of blood in arteries is controlled by contraction and relaxation of the muscle fibers in the walls that expand or contract the lumen of the artery and the volume available for blood flow. To increase blood flow to an area, muscle cells in the arterial wall relax. To decrease blood flow, muscle cells in the arterial wall contract. When an artery is lacerated, initially blood escapes the vessel very quickly under high pressure. However, muscle fibers within the wall immediately begin to contract, causing the artery to spasm and contract. Eventually, this results in constriction of the injured artery, limiting ongoing loss of blood. A vein, on the other hand, is a low pressure blood vessel. Its walls are thin and it depends on valves for the control of blood flow. When a vein is lacerated, blood will escape relatively slowly under low pressure. But the vein is unable to spasm and contract and without the application of external pressure, it continues to bleed and bleed and bleed until it is either ligated or sewn shut or cauterized. So although a vein laceration is a lower pressure injury, it is still problematic for several reasons. Scott demonstrated great calmness and presence of mind when he used his shirt and his thumb to apply pressure to the bleeding wound in his neck. Well done, definitely surgeon approved. Scott mentions his awareness of his heart rate and its relationship to the rate of bleeding. Obviously, with this type of injury, it is normal to become excited and certainly anxious once the severity of injury becomes apparent. As excitatory hormones are circulated through the body in response to the fight or flight reflex, it takes significant effort to rally oneself and to restore calm composure. It was also quite a good idea to force himself to talk in order to remain conscious. As mentioned previously, the brain is quite hungry for oxygen and nutrients. So loss of consciousness in the context of hemorrhage or uncontrolled bleeding is a sign of impending shock where blood loss leads to organ failure and death. Again, great clarity of thought in this high pressure life or death situation. I cut my shirt off. There wasn't anything there, but when I got to the hospital, they x-rayed me and they said my right lung had collapsed because it had filled with blood and that was from this little guy here puncturing my lung as well. Scott notes that although there was no outward signs of injury to his chest, radiographs in the emergency department revealed a hemothorax, a condition where the chest fills with blood within the chest cavity, but outside of the lung. A hemothorax behaves in much the same way as does a pneumothorax, except that with a hemothorax, the deformation is caused by blood rather than air. The chest cavity can accumulate over 1.5 liters of blood. That's about five to six units. A hemothorax can result in shock by several methods. Massive bleeding that results in inadequate blood volume to keep all of the critical organs perfused with blood and venous pressure where the retained blood within the chest cavity compresses the vena cava and stops the return of blood to the heart. So from there, uh, they had to intubate me while I was wide awake and uh, I tell you, that is not fun. Scott mentions that they had to perform an awake intubation. This is a process where they place a breathing tube down the trachea to ensure that there is protected airway so that if the patient loses consciousness, they can still be mechanically ventilated to keep them alive. This technique is indicated if there is reasonable chance that you might lose the airway during the process of intubation. It is generally not that pleasant and an experience, but was necessary here given the injury to Scott's neck and the lack of clarity as to the full extent of his injuries. In the circumstance of a questionable airway, it is the safest way to place a breathing tube. Take this long metal rod with a point on it and they stick it through your rib cage and uh, it just, it wasn't fun. Here Scott is describing a technique used to place the chest tube. A chest tube is a flexible clear tube that is placed into your chest cavity from the outside that is attached to a suction apparatus that evacuates the air or blood that is trapped within the chest cavity. The chest tube allows the evacuation of the chest cavity so that the external pressure that is compressing the lung or the vena cava can be relieved. Its placement requires a small dissection between two ribs and the insertion of the tube bluntly into the chest cavity. If performed when awake, this too is not a fun procedure to experience. As the chest is evacuated, the lung is more able to expand into the available space on inspiration and it becomes easier to breathe. They did a number on me. So you can see this cut here and this actually goes 
all the way down to right here. To repair my jugular in my lung, they had to open up my chest completely. Scott describes a thoracotomy, a procedure where the chest cavity is formally opened in a surgical procedure to expose the contents of the thorax. In this case, it appears that they entered the chest cavity through the sternum, so this was technically a sternotomy. The chest cavity is usually closed with wires after the procedure in the thoracic cavity is completed. They told me a guy my size should hold six to eight units of blood and total from all the blood I lost from the initial injury and the surgeries, they had to give me five units. Generally, a large adult male will have a blood volume of approximately six liters. This equates to approximately 12 units of whole blood or 24 units of packed red blood cells in total. Given the degree of blood loss that he experienced during the injury and the subsequent surgery, Scott was transfused with five units, most likely packed red blood cells. This would have been a volume of approximately one and a quarter to one and a half liters of blood overall, which would represent one fifth to one quarter of his total blood volume. For the record, that is a lot of blood. It's a whole freaking lot of blood. There was also a chance that I could have had a stroke. To repair your jugular vein, they have to pinch it off. Well, your jugular vein supplies the oxygenated blood to your brain. So they can only pinch it off for so long. They pinch it off, they repair it, and then after that, when they open it back up, all that blood rushes into your brain and there's a chance you could have a stroke. The jugular vein is one of the main vessels drawing blood away from the brain. Occlusion of this vessel will not cause a stroke in the same way occlusion of an artery supplying the brain would. Occlusion of an artery will impede oxygenated blood from entering the brain, which will starve the brain of necessary oxygen and eventually cause the death of brain tissue or a stroke. The jugular vein contains blood that has already left the brain after the oxygen has already been extracted. Occlusion of this vessel will cause blood that is exiting the brain to back up into the brain, causing edema or swelling of the brain that could ultimately prove fatal. It is certainly correct that the time that we can keep the flow clamped is limited. So it is always important for surgeons to work as expediently as possible to complete the vascular repair so that they can resume blood flow in as short a time as possible. A stroke upon resumption of blood flow is certainly possible, but this is something that generally occurs on the arterial side rather than the venous side. They had to do surgery on that as well. I have pins in my finger to hold it in place. Fortunately, the fracture in Scott's hand could be stabilized with a closed reduction and percutaneous pin fixation. These are generally pins that are placed through the skin into the fracture to hold it in place until the fracture is healed. Usually, these pins remain in place for about six to eight weeks, after which time they are removed. And like I said, they had to repair my orbital bone in three spots. As you can see, they cut me here and right here. And they also cut inside my mouth, all the way back here to the front to be able to get to all of those spots. Scott also describes the three incision approach used to repair his orbital and facial fractures that included a supraorbital incision, an infraorbital incision, and a transbuccal incision within his mouth. So for about two days, I had tubes coming out of the front of my chest, one tube coming out of my right side, and one tube coming out from behind my collarbone to drain everything around my lungs. Now to carry this little vacuum pack with me. For several days after his surgery, Scott remained connected to a number of tubes that were draining his chest. As mentioned, these tubes were connected to a reservoir that would measure the amount of drainage of fluids from the chest cavity after the repair. These tubes would remain in place until physicians determined that there was no further drainage into the chest cavity. In Scott's case, this was about three days. Overall, Scott was in hospital for about six days, which is a pretty short period of time for an injury that could have easily taken his life. Shout out to the trauma team at Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville. The doctors told me that if it wasn't for this thumb, that I would have died. This thumb saved my life. My wife came up with a saying, she said, just put a thumb in it. And I thought that was the funniest thing ever. So. That's what we're going with. I really love Scott's upbeat outlook on the whole incident. Obviously, he loves what he does and plans to continue filming content upon recovery. Judging from the caption on his shirt, Just put a thumb in it. When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Well played, sir. Well played. So those are my thoughts on how Kentucky Ballistics almost died. If you think that I left something out, be sure to let me know in the comment section down below. And if there's something else that you want me to comment on, let me know that too. Thanks for watching. I will see you for rounds next week. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. There's a flesh wound.